Did you enjoy your break? Lots of food to eat? Now you're going to sleep on me. Um, whatever I'm going to say in this session will be in, in a seminal form. I'm, I'm just seeding a few thoughts. There will be a lot of gaps. You would have to meditate, dialogue, think on some of the things that are being said. But if you forget a host of things, just remember that what I'm trying to present is some strategic steps that each one of us should take, that includes me, uh, in ensuring that we move smoothly to the fulfillment of purpose. But you have to understand what even a corporate anointing, while a corporate anointing comes upon the church, and it's definitely falling on sectors of the church. Nothing happens without creating the conditions for the anointing to prosper. Like seed in the ground needs uh, the preparation of the ground. We need to learn how to create environment, atmosphere, uh, systems, and conditions for the word of God to grow. Uh, we can learn from Ezekiel and Isaiah, great prophets who prophesied many powerful things, that words given by God through these prophets, uh, prophets are installed into the atmosphere. And they wait for the right conditions before they drip into the earth. So these words are dropped into atmospheres but the conditions that we create determines how these words are absorbed and brought into our being. So some prophetic words could take hundreds of years to be fulfilled, and uh, whereas they could take a few years to be, be, be fulfilled. It's subject to how we create the environment for such things to happen. In the economy of God's kingdom, there's order, there's planning, there's careful thought given to whatever we do. God is a structured God. I know sometimes in Pentecostal circles, the circle I grew up in, we just believe that things will happen robotically even if we are not prepared. But God always used preparatory principles to create the environment in which his word would prosper. So the delay is not subject to God being unfaithful to his promises. The delay in most cases is that we have not de developed the skill of a listening ear. The skill of a listening ear is not only to hear, but to see and do what the Lord says. Whatever you hear, you have to see it, conceptualize it, take ownership of it before it is established in a given context. But if we do it correctly, I can assure you that you will see things happening at a rapid rate. The speed at which things are being done presently, uh, it's just phenomenal. Oh, it's phenomenal. It's like in the season where the reaper is overtaking the sower. That's the speed. And while you're thinking about sowing, Others are reaping, uh, and it speaks about the, the quickness which uh, God is doing things presently. In this series I'm presenting with you, I need to say a few things. Not everything can be possessed. Everything that should be possessed is subject to how God has mapped out or delineated or categorized what you can have. In the wilderness side of the, the Jordan, a part of the land was part of the promised land. It was given to two and a half tribes of Israel, uh, Reuben, G uh, Gad, 
and half the tribe of Manasseh. So the promised land, Canaan land, included a section of the wilderness, a luscious section, uh, very successful. You know, the grass is green on both sides of the river. And uh, extremely productive. And there was, an, there was a very powerful principality that ruled over that region called the Edom, uh, the, the, the spirit of the Amorite, the Amorite, I beg your pardon, the Amorite, very, very powerful spirit. But before you can take that spirit, God first tells you what you can take and what you can't. Yeah, I know there's a carte blanche approach uh, by many Christians who adopt the philosophy of positive thinking. We are not positive thinkers. We think in terms of faith, but ultimately in terms of obedience. Uh, the charismatic season was characterized by faith steps. The apostolic season is characterized by obedience steps. Uh, Abraham did not sin because he was unfaithful. Abra uh, not Abraham, Adam. Adam did not sin because he was unfaithful. Adam sinned because he was disobedient. After his disobedience, faith was given to man because he lived from his soul. He was a soulish man. But when we come back to Christ, through his obedience, we all have been saved. By one man's disobedience, we fell into sin and was disconnected from God. Through another man's obedience, we were reconciled to God. We are now moving to a place where we don't, have, we don't operate in the measure of faith, but we operate in the fullness of obedience. There is no degrees uh, to, to how, how you obey. You just simply obey like a slave. You don't, you don't have a choice. That's where we're moving to. So in the economy of God's kingdom, you must know what God has given you and what God has not given you. When God drew the map for possession, he didn't say to Joshua, wherever you set your feet, you'll possess the land. He first said to Joshua, this is the map. These are the sections you can possess. But the map also had certain clauses, conditional clauses. And the conditional clauses was that certain sections you could not possess. You could not possess it. So I want to now introduce to you three specific groups of people. God said to Joshua, to Moses, and then to Joshua, you cannot take. So we, sometimes we see a car driving down the road and I say, and we say, I claim it in Jesus' name. Okay. Oh, you know, I'll just claim this land, but God never even send you to that neighborhood. So positive thinking can be extremely dangerous, and it could teeter on, on being covetous. And obedient people are not covetous. But that does not mean they don't covet to know the will of God for their lives. They long to know the will of God. So one of the, one of the people groups that God said you will not pos uh, possess, and they were relatives to the nation of Israel. They were relatives. But God said, I've given them their own land. If they want to live in it, they can. But you will not take that land. And it was all on the wilderness side of the, the Jordan. The first land was owned by the Edomites. Edomites. Edom is a descendant of Esau. Now please, what I'm going to tell you now is attitudes, dispositions, and doctrinal positions that must be fixed into your spirits. These are very important things. The first kind of people you must not possess, and, and who you possess uh, in most cases becomes uh, what you embrace. You understand? So, so the first group is you must not possess the land of Edom, and the father of Edom was Esau. 
you know, you, you know, and I referred to this in the last session, that, that Isaac had two sons, and, and they became pregnant, his wife became pregnant when he was 60 years old, and, and she had a troubled pregnancy, and, and because it, she, she could not understand the state of her pregnancy, she consulted with God. There was no gynecologist in those days. And God told her that she is the mother of two nations and, uh, and that the younger nation will be at, uh, that, and, the, and the two nations will be at loggerheads with each other and the younger will rule over the older. And there will be two distinct people groups. And uh, when they came out, she found that the first boy that came out was all red. So they called his name Isu. And clutching on his heels was the second son. Um, and because he was trying to pull his brother back into the womb, as if to say, well, the fight started in the womb. That's where the trouble started there. The babies were fighting each other. And the one guy got so beaten up, he came out red. So they called him Sin. They called him Edom, which means red-like, sin-like, earth-like, and somebody who had the tendency or the proclivity to always lean upon earthly, carnal, humanistic desires. And his name was Isu, the father of the Edomites. The other son, because he was clutching on heels, pulling down, trying to be better than the first, claiming to want to be first out of the womb because he understood firstborn principles, firstborn status, the whole, the whole, you know, the fundamentals of the firstborn. The firstborn, you know, had the right to, to manage his father's estate, sat at the right hand, wore the coat of many colors, had divine favor, got a double portion of his father's uh, uh, inheritance, all of that stuff. So... So Jacob was pulling his brother back to say, I don't want you to be first, I want to be the first. So they called him Jacob, which means supplanter. Some supplanter, one who dispossesses another of his station in life. And, um, and obviously, you know the story, Jacob uses deceit, guile. I mean, Jacob uses anyone to get to the top. He's, uh, he uses stumbling blocks to become stepping stones. And he becomes a stumbling block. And so he gets the birthright privilege from his brother Isu, and, and he also gets the patriarchal blessing from his father Jacob. But God hated Isu because Isu gave Jacob the firstborn privilege, uh, and he sold it for a bowl of food. So appetite, the earthling, personal desires, his human passions got the better of him and he sold one of the greatest privileges you can have in the economy of God's kingdom, which is to be God's firstborn. The firstborn belongs to the Lord. The firstborn cannot be consecrated to the Lord. The firstborn cannot be dedicated. Anything that is first is the Lord's. That's why you give first fruits first things, while you honor God with the first of anything that comes. Um, um, Abel understood this. He gave God the first links, not a tithe. Abel didn't give a tithe. He gave the first because he knew that he could not touch what is rightfully God's. And, um, but this boy didn't know it. And the Bible later on will say that God hated him. Now, God is a God of love. For God to hate something or someone, the principle is God could not reconcile how this fellow could sell what was not his. How he could give up something that was so privileged. Because God was supposed to be called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Not Jacob. He sold it. So God says, you will not possess the land of Eden, which literally means you will not function 
humanistically. You will not function as an earthling. You will not function with the idea of self-preservation or with selfish ambitions. You will not live for your appetite. You will not live for yourself. And God said, anyone that possesses that in territory will adopt an individualistic, humanistic, existential, self-governing, self-determination principle of life. I can't allow you to have that. So that land I'm not giving to you. Those guys chose to be independent of me. They didn't want to see themselves as firstborns. They didn't want to be part of covenantal blessings. You will not possess that land. The point I want to make with you, to all of us here, we are forbidden, forbidden to adopt the Isu position, state of existence in our life's journey. We are forbidden to think outside of firstborn status. In Christ, you are the firstborn. Firstborns belong to the high priesthood in the Old Covenant. All firstborns were represented through the Levitical tribe. When Levi served Aaron as an attendant, Levi represented every firstborn of every family of every tribe in Israel. So in Levi's ministering to Aaron, or ministering in the temple, um, God saw every family represented through the principle of the first. That's why the Bible says the first leavens the lump. When you give your first fruits, you're actually releasing something into your future. When you tithe, you're tithing out of your past. When you give your first, that's why the Bible tells us that Abel still speaks in Hebrews chapter 11. He speaks positively, qualitatively, dynamically, he speaks influentially, he's like yeast in the dough. So, so this fellow gave up his right to speak. He gave up his right to sit at the right hand. He gave up his right to be a, a heir like the firstborn that will divide his father's estate. When Jesus came, he didn't bring us to be priest. He brought us back to the place Whereas the firstborn in him, we would be high priest. We'll belong to the family of the high priest. We can run boldly into the presence. The Levites could not. The veil prohibited them from entering. But, but the high priest, the, the, the order of Aaron and other priests later on of that order, they could go into the presence. And Jesus broke the veil so that we could be with him in the most holy place. Are you with me? So it is in this context, God is saying, I'm not giving you the land or the disposition or the state or the mentality of Isu who live for his stomach, for his appetite, for his selfish aims. He never understood that, that if you're a firstborn, I take care of you, that you are the apple of my eye. You are my child and you are not one of many children, you are my first. You sit with me at my right hand. Are you understanding? These are very, very important pointers. So when we talk about the spirit of Isu, and when God says don't possess that, even in, before you can even cross your Jordan, the place of total descent or death, you must adopt an attitude that I am a son of God and I will not live in the land that sells birthright. You can, it's impossible to have an identity crisis in this season if you want to be part of what God is doing. You can't tell me that you still have to work on your identity. And your identity, your election and calling before time began is not to be an asher or to be some fivefold minister or to be some, uh, some servant in the house of God. Your, your predetermined position is that God called you to be his firstborn son in Christ. And whatever he is, you are. If he is the firstborn, you are the firstborn. If he's the son of God, you're the son of God. If he's a king, you're a king. You understand? If he's the head, you're in the head. Even though we call the body of Christ. 
meaning there's only one person, one body. Are you understanding this? And many in the church today don't know what they are. So they're looking for a prophet to tell, give them a prophecy. The prophecy is only to define your steps, not define your identity. This is very important. Very important. And if you're looking around, then you are, you're looking for a futurist to tell you your future. Or a seer, or, or, or a prophesier, and we don't need that. I'm not saying we don't need prophecy. I, I take every prophecy, seriously. But it's not to tell me who I am. It's only to help me know what I'm doing. And this is critical. So say to your neighbor, do not adopt the position of Isu. God hates him. God calls him unrighteous. God calls him a fornicator. He goes and sleeps around with everybody. He doesn't know who he is. He doesn't understand covenant, the marriage bed, submission to the purposes of God. These are very important pointers. The second people group that God said you must not take is the Moabites. You all know that Moab is a son of Esau by incest, a son of Lot by incest. Moab was born incestuously when the daughters of Lot got their father intoxicated, drunk, and then they, they found a way of getting his seed sexually. Uh, they wanted to be surrogates of their father's seed. They found an illegal way to carry the seed of a father. And, um, and these two girls wanted to preserve their father's name, but they did not value how seed is transferred to the marriage bed. They chose incest. This is a wicked, carnal, illegal way of trying to be part of a lineage. They didn't choose marriage. They didn't choose covenant. They chose doing something that is unthinkable and forbidden in old covenant theology or law. The name Moab means what father or who needs a father. The second land that God said you will not possess is the attitude, the state, the disposition that I don't need a father, God is my father. I can choose independence because I don't want to be under submission and the rod of instruction. We have many churches today headed by men, but if you really look in the spirit, they're not fathers. And any house that is fatherless is a widow's house or an orphanage. Because true religion is to care for the widow and visit the orphan. That's what James tells us in James chapter 1. God puts the solitary in families. And you cannot have a family without having a, 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 a pater. The word for family is patria in the Greek. And you cannot have patria without tracing the root word to patria, which is pater, father. If you, if you remove fathers, you have widows' houses and orphanages. Many churches are fatherless, headless, and it, you can be a man. You can have male genitals and still be fatherless. The churches should not be headed by apostles, prophets. I'm talking about households now in the church. The, the congregations, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. The church should be headed by elders, which we refer to as representative fathers. If you do not accept that, if you, you dilute the significance of fathers, and I know there's bad examples. I know there's, you don't throw the, the, the baby with the dirty water. You have to select you have to be discerning, analytical. There's discretion that's been needed in the season. 
If, if some men claimed to be fathers, but they abused, they were pedophiles, they, 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 they desecrated the house of God, those were not fathers, but that does not mean you reject the idea of fathering. As the Bible tells us in Malachi that God will first make straight the way. How does he do it? By returning fathers to their sons, sons to their fathers, lest I smite the earth with a curse. The word lest I smite the earth with the curse in the Hebrew means lest I reduce the human race to redundancy. That's what it means, to nothingness. Unless we bring back the fathers, and you know one of the biggest problems we have, anthropologists, sociologists, and other people that study human behavior will tell you. The biggest problem we have and all the, the problems you have in the Cape and so forth is because of fatherlessness or dysfunctional family homes where there were single you know, parents that headed the home and mostly it was mothers, but no fathers. And we produced a culture of delinquency uh, and, uh, and every other behavior. And how do we fix this? You never fix anything naturally. You always fix it spiritually first. And the spiritual permutation, computation is very simple. We bring back fathers. If you adopt the attitude that I don't need a father, then you're a Moab. You live in the land of Moab and God said, I do not want you there. You know the story of Elimelech and his wife, Nahomi? And you know that they had two sons, Marlon and Julian, and they lived in the house of bread in the city of David called Bethlehem, which was once called Ephrata, the place of fruitfulness that became the place of bread distribution. But because there was famine in a, in a place where you're supposed to be eating bread, they found the easy way to go to a luscious piece of land called Moab. Across the Jordan, very successful, lots of seed, lots of bread. And they lived in that land only to discover that Elimelech dies, um, Marlon dies, Chulian dies, and they are left, uh, the family is bereft, uh, Naomi and their two daughters-in-law were left as widows. The spirit of Moab will kill fathers. The spirit of Moab will select Prophets to prophesy against Father Inc. Families. And, and Balaam was seconded, recruited, employed by King Balak the Moabite to speak against the orderly way these people were going through the land. And wherever they went, they became like locusts. They'd wipe out the spirit that attacks Father Inc. and families. And this present move of God is about restoring families to the earth. And we can't get it in the natural because society has destroyed family. Even Western society, they kick the kids out as soon as they are grown enough to fend for themselves. And as a result, after that, they perpetuate the culture of each man for himself. You go there and survive. I've, I've, 18 years is too much for me to care for you. And I'm not in any way suggesting that we don't need to teach our kids independence and, and so forth, self-sustenance and so forth. But, but we've destroyed the spirit of family. We have a dismembered culture in the world. We do not need the spirit of family, uh, of Moab. Say to your neighbor, do not live in the land of Moab. The second, the third group of people, the third group of people was a brother of Moab. He was born of the second daughter of Lot. And his name was Ben-Ami. Son, son of my brother, or son of a community, but not son of a father. And out of this group comes the Ammonites. God said, you will not have given them their own land. They want to live like this. They can live. They can live in fraternity. They can live in 
what they call brotherhood, but they will not recognize fathering. In other words, the one brother kills fathering, and the other brother elevates fraternity. It sounds so nice, but the whole idea of fraternity is the principle of co-equality. So in the land, land of Ben-Ami, you don't look for fathers. You look for a brother and say, won't you lead us? You got the clothes. You got the tools. You got the gifts. Uh, so it's a culture of co-equality. And when you're not happy with the brother, you just re-vote for another brother. And it produces what we call in democratic language, democratic states where you can choose who you want and when you child with them, you just vote them out. And we've got beautiful Western examples like in certain countries in the West where today you're a hero, tomorrow you're a, you're, you're a vandal, you're a, you're a villain. And we've seen this. We've seen this in this own country. Men masquerade as fathers, get into the position, but they and then they kicked out because they were not fathers. But it's a fraternity. And I want to say to all of us here today, you cannot adopt. Listen, I believe in the co-equality of every member of the body of Christ. I need to say that as a disclaimer. I believe that people like myself, who heads churches, some of them are here, I am not more important than the rest. We all are co-equal, but we have to understand the plurality in the body of Christ, and that some members are less than the other members, even though every member is very important. And no member is unimportant. There is ranking in the spirit. There's metrons of grace. There's metrons uh, uh, of anointing. There is governmental spheres. And even Aaron and Miriam, who were the biological uh, siblings to Moses, and when they started to question the integrity of his relationship, then God called Moses and said, I'm going to remove Aaron and Miriam. And he caused cancer to come upon them. Leprosy. Leprosy. And um, until Moses interceded and said, please give them a chance. You know the story of the sons of Korah? They, these are cousins, first cousins of Moses and Aaron. And Korah incited a rebellion with 250 people, leaders, influential leaders in the whole of Israel. And the rebellion was incited on the principle of co-equality. And Korah and his cohorts, they made statements like, who is Moses? He knows the presence, but so do we. We carry the Ark of the Covenant. That's what the, the, the Kohatites, he was from the tribe of Kohat. We carry the Ark of the Covenant. We handle holy things. He handles holy things. We can hear from God, and they can. So what makes them better than us? We don't need them. We can go directly to God. And God said, I will teach you a lesson. God caused an earthquake to take place, and the whole 250 of those leaders, together with all their families, were swallowed up. And rabbinical tradition tells us that if there was a needle and a thread in their tent, it was also removed so that there was no remembrance of them. I'm not against the protection of the interest of every person. I believe that if you are under the Spirit of God, then the Spirit of justice should be on you. And that everyone should be treated equally. But in the body of Christ, when it comes to leadership functions, there's no equals. That's why the Bible says, even a leader of a church, a bishop, an episcope, pos, an overseeing bishop, must not be insubordinate not be insubordinate. In other words, everyone has to be in submission. I've submitted myself to Dr. Sam Solon, to Dr. Segi Govinda, and, uh, and a whole team of people. My wife, Marolan, if she knows that I'm not living the life, 
or if I'm, if I'm, I've, I'm, I've got some areas that need to be dealt with, she has the right to pick up the phone, call these men, and hold me accountable to my behavior. And all my sons can do that because that is a fundamental of not becoming a king in your own eyes. Are you hearing me? These are very important points. And Ben Ami speaks about co-equality, speaks about fraternity without fatherhood. So the one kills fatherhood, the other elevates brotherhood. And that's how in today's language you have tribalism. You have, uh, you have sectarianism. You have one people group elevating the other people group, uh, fighting the other uh, people group and elevating themselves. And we have all sorts of problems in the earth today because we've not understood the principle of fathering. Fathering. And the principle of fathering is a very compounded one. It's not the father. But Moses is a type of Christ, but Moses never walked alone. He walked with his 70 other fathers where there was accountability. And so when we talk about fathering, we're not elevating a few men to become autocrats and create a new monarchy within the body of Christ. No, no. Uh, but please, I'm begging you, if we're going to move towards this next two-year phase, you have to make those transitions by crossing rivers, but you have to also adopt positions that I will not reject my firstborn status, I know who I am. I will not reject fathers because I don't want to be a father killer that's called patricide. And I will not make a brother a father when he's not called to be a father. Absalom is a good example of that. He challenged the integrity of his father, Solomon, uh, David developed a charismatic disposition in the gates of the city, rode the best chariot of his day, was the most handsome amongst men, and he postured himself with haircuts, hairstyles, and so forth. And he mobilized the whole of Israel against, his, against David and caused an insurrection, but a fathering spirit will not touch his son. David went across the Jordan and hid in Gilgal until God dealt with his son. Absalom had many children, if you read the Bible record, but the Bible says he had no sons. And he had male and female children. And he built as a remembrance for himself a memorial stone to remind him that he was anointed to be king and he would be a better father, a better king than his father David. But the only remembrance we have of him is a stone. Are you hearing me today? Please, I beg you, I beg you, don't go into these narrow positions. And evangelical Christianity, Protestant Christianity, uh, and its offshoots, whether it's Reformation theology or whatever, has some very delusional teachings. As great as Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Huss and other great men were and wrote some phenomenal books. And, but one of the greatest dangers was because they were anti or angry with the father of the church of their day, which was the Pope. And he was in cahoots with civil leaders like the kings, the, the emperors of his day. They became anti-father. They decapitated the idea of fathering. They created a co-equal uh, co eldership called the presbytery of elders, where every brother was equal without headship. And today we have cessational theology. We have anti-fathering moves. And, we, and people don't want to even hear of this thing of the father-son dyad. And study the theologies. And, and these men were great men. Some of their teachings we embrace. But they also had blind spots. 
because of the milieu in which they came from, which was a wicked milieu, where father, men masqueraded as fathers, but they were, they were false, they were counterfeits. And I'm saying to all of us here today, we have to be extremely careful we don't understand that. So let me now, for the, last 20, the next 20 minutes, talk about the Amorite. So if you deal with the rivers that you must cross, and the people that you must not adopt their positions and stay in their land, because these lands are characterized by these things that I've highlighted, then you are ready to take the, the first enemy, who is called the Amorite. Actually, the Amorite, who means one who profiles himself publicly, is a publicist. That's, that's the meaning, the Amorite. Regrettably, we don't have enough history to be able to go back and do a proper exegesis on the historical context in which the Amorite functioned. So we have to extract things from, that are hidden in names. Because names are a beautiful way to start, sometimes enumerate hidden truths that are in God. While we can't get into, into semantics, where you just make the name your theology, but we have to also look and see. Now, this was a dominant spirit. I mean, Abraham spoke about the Amorite when he spoke about the 400 years that people will be in captivity, the people of Israel, before God will lead them out and, the, the, and that the sin of the Amorite would have matured. And when they came into the, uh, across the Red Sea, uh, God told them to spy the land. Or There's two versions. There's two versions. One is that Moses commanded the people, the, the leaders, to go and spy the land, the fathers of 12 tribes, 11 tribes, and the other view is that the fathers made the proposal to uh, Moses, can we first go and see the land before we take it? And God told him, told Moses, go ahead and tell them to do it. So those are the two schools of thought. But when they came back and gave the reports, um, and just before they gave the reports, God had already told them they must possess the land of the Amorite. That was when they crossed the river and had already come into, into the wilderness. God said, the first enemy you must conquer, that's at the beginning of 40 years, was the Amorite. But because they came back with a report that violated their position of being able to conquer, to possess, because remember, they were, they were disenfranchised in their thinking. They were subdued through a horrible system called slavery. Uh, they were marginalized. They, they, they had very poor self-esteem. All the things I spoke about in the transitions you must make. Um, they didn't believe they had capacity or the skill set. They never even had an army. So, and here was God telling them to possess the land. So they came back and said to God, we are like locusts in our own eyesight. We are, we are small. They had a minimalistic view of themselves. Very narrow view. And they didn't think of themselves much. You see, while we are not filled with self-esteem, we should understand who we are in Christ. You're understanding. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You understand that. So if you're as short as me, you won't see yourself so short when you know that you can do big things. Are you understanding? Not because of who you are, but who Christ is in you. These are very important aspects. So, so God tells them, well, if you, this is how you believe, then I'm not with you. And when you all that have voted, and those were, not everyone voted that crossed the Red Sea. Only those 20 years and above voted. Anyone under 20 was not guilty of the decisions that the fathers made. So God said, 20 years and above, so of the 600,000 men, whoever was 20 years and above, they were judged. So God said, I'm not with you, I'll wait for you to die. And then 
I'll take your children and anyone else that has the right attitude, including Caleb and Joshua, into the promised land. That's what God said. Then they said, no, then we're going to go and fight the Amorites. That's in the first year. We'll go and fight the Amorites and we'll kill them. And God said, but don't go. I'm not with you. And they went up these mountains and they fought the Amorites. And the Amorites attacked them and they were scattered like bees attacking people. And they, were, and they lost thousands of men. God said, I told you not to go. When I told you to go, you said you didn't want to go. When I told you I'm not going with you, you said you want to go. And then for the next 38 years, they had to wait until God said, now go and take the Amorite. That's what I'm saying. If you can't defeat your enemy at the beginning, you're going to eventually have to fight him. So learn quickly. That's the principle of learn. If God tells you to do something, just do it. If he tells you give, just give. Don't say, oh, but I won't pay the rent after that. If he told, tells you, just do it and see how he'll take care of you. If he says forgive, just forgive. Why carry it? Because you'll die of unforgiveness. If he says release the bitterness, release it. Because if you hold it, you're going to poison your spirit. Just do what he tells you. So it's in that context, we have to now look at the, in the two-year period how they take the Amorite. So who is the Amorite? The Amorite is a person who publicly profiles himself. It's a very prominent spirit, very prominent spirit. It lived in, on mountains, which speaks about dominance. Lives on mountains, which is dominance. It was called, listen to this, it was called the Westerners. They were called the Westerners. Isn't that very comparative presently? The Westerners. And their greatest ability, their skill set, was to speak. They were the sayers. They were called the sayer. An amazing spirit. The sayer. So what is a sayer? One who uses speech to shape ideologies so that it can dominate mindsets. And if you control mindsets, you control people groups. How was Babylon created? Genesis chapter 11. The founder, they say, of Babylon is a man called Nimrod. Nimrod was a hunter. In modern day language, he didn't just hunt animals, but he was, he was a man who knew how to dominate societies, people groups. He was, he was what you would call a colonialist or an imperialist. He understood how to have domination. Nimrod. Nimrod understood that if you want to dominate the world, you have to bring them together and keep them as a global village. If you control their minds, you control their movements. And if you control their movements, you control their destiny. And the imagery is that he built a tower. He didn't just build a tower, he built a city and a tower that reached to heaven which means that he created a dominant oversight over the people. But that doesn't give us any clues to the point I want to make. And then God said, listen to this, God said, what these people imagine they can do. Nothing is impossible to them because they become one. He didn't say they became united. He said they became one. This is not ecumenical unit. This is one. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And God said, let us come 
and stop what they're doing. And what did, how did he stop it? He didn't go and release fire and brimstone to destroy the city and the tower. But he said, let us confuse their speech. Because they have one lip and one language. One organ of communication, SABC. Okay. CNN. BBC. And they all speak the same language. The same lip. The same lingo. Not Afrikaans. I know that's the heavenly language. So what did God do? He came and he confused their speech. And they started to babble. And one man could not understand another man. And that's how Babylon... The people spread out and divided or scattered over the earth. So what is the spirit of the Amorite? To dominate by controlling your minds through articulate, eloquent speech. And speech is ideology, paradigms, worldviews, dominant and prevailing patterns of thinking, and so forth. So if you want to conquer the Amorite, you have to know how the Amorite presents his theses, his worldview. In the 21st century, we have to translate this because this, and these guys were called giants. Physically huge people, like, like, Goliath was in front of David, um, and intimidating. It was daunting to stand in front of this kind of stature. So it's in that context, you have to understand, ask the question, who is the dominant people group that's shaping the worldview presently? And... How do they dominate from the mountains? You know, I know about all these seven mountain things. I, I just believe in one mountain. That the stone will fill the earth and become one mountain and all the other mountains will disappear. That's Daniel's view. You have to ask questions like, what are the prominent or popular opinions, hypotheses, um, viewpoints that are being used today. You have to ask yourself questions like, which are the people that eloquently present themselves in the world? They are articulate. They have polished speech. Who is the ideological giant we have to conquer? And it's self-explanatory, I think. Where do we get most of our theologies from, our ideologies from, our educational you know, sources from? Where are, where are the intellectuals located? Or oh, how do they function as a fraternity? You have to ask all these questions. You have to also ask the question, how do they export their offerings to the world? And obviously, we've got Western government, governments that protect certain ideologies, and they become the custodians of it. We also have universities that export these ideologies, including theology now. Theology is no more theology, it's called interfaith. And Christianity is one of the religions you study in the theology. You have to ask, uh, how, you know, you have to ask serious questions. And without trying to oversimplify, we know that the Western world shapes the worldview. And there is contestations taking, from, taking place with other kingdoms, like like the Russian kingdom that is trying to contradict 
the Western worldview. And yes, there's all sorts of fights taking place presently. But we live in a postmodern world. In postmodernism, the view of everybody is accepted as a normative view. That's why now there's offshoots, ancillary arms to postmodernism, like the woke movement, where even minority groups must be protected. If somebody chooses to function in a certain gender identity, even though by sex they may be male, but they choose based on their psychology to become a fame female, the woke movement says you have to protect them. That means that if your child is eight years old and comes to you and tells you that, yes, I know I'm a boy, but I want to be a girl, you have no right to change their view. You have no right. They have the legal right to choose for themselves. And this is frightening. There's clever arguments today for how marriage is now being polluted through various same-sex institutions. The view on materialism, the self-existence and success of every individual based on an economic purview that is being promulgated by a beast system, a predatorial system, and you'd have to read about the beast in the book of Revelation. This is a world system that uses economy to subdue people so that you can have the number 666 uh, the, and you have to have wisdom and the number 666 on your, on, on your mindset is that you have to think like a man, like a beast. And your, your triune being, 666, body, soul, spirit, spirit, soul, body, must think humanistically, must think survivalistically, must think for you, yourself, because it's the survival of the fittest. You should not share what you have with others. You cannot have all things in common. You must just live for yourself. And when you have, you can be humanitarian. So there's a diversity of ideologies that we have to... And you need to know the science of the... The, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the Egyptians. You need to know the science of how the world thinks. And people like, like Moses had to tr be trained. That's why Moses' first default point was when he spoke to God and God said, I'm sending you to liberate my people. He said, I can't do it because I don't have the polished speech. Because speech subdues kings. And I have... I don't have the capacity to speak because I lost, I forgot how these guys operate. And so, what's the point? The point is very simple. I'm asking all church leaders not to become students of the ideologies of the world, but to know how the world thinks. The greatest warfare that apostles in the early church functioned, uh, ex uh, encountered was a warfare of every thought exalting itself against the knowledge of Christ. These are not little thoughts that people have about does God exist and so forth in the church. These are well-organized patterns of thinking that needs to be completely dismantled. And if you study people like Solomon, he even delved on looking at life in its various forms and tried to study everything from the solar systems to the, the workings of man, to the behavior of the rich, to all sorts of issues in life. And he realized that if God does not become the center, everything equates to vanity. And that's how you get the book of Ecclesiastes. And there's no true answer to God, but through getting to know God. 
And so I'm saying to all of us here today, the Amorite spirit is the dominant spirit that masquerades itself publicly, but it controls you through the mind. And you do know how the new covenant works. To become one new man in Christ, you have to be, you can't conform to this world, but transform by by the renewal of your mind. And Colossians 3.10 tells us that you cannot come to embrace the image of Christ until you renovate the way you think. And much of the way the world thinks is already in your mind. If you went to university or if you just embrace a certain culture or a certain worldview, you'll be surprised to discover that your mind is filled with half-truths. Half theology, half secular thinking. That's why we are having such a problem in the church today. Because we're preaching more to Samaritans than true Jews. Church has to come back. And pastors need to be clinical, analytical. And while we're not, we, and we're not here to promote the ideologies of the world. But you need to know what you have to dismantle. Jeremiah is a perfect example of this. He could not just go and tell them, thus saith the Lord. He had to first go and uproot, tear down, throw out before he laid foundations. And you, this is not agri agricultural language. This is methodology. You need to know about postmodernism. You have to know why our kids are saying there's no absolutes. You have to know why they say that they can marry anybody. You have to know how they've been messed up in their thinking. And unless you capture our kids, and Daniel is a good example of this. Daniel had to make a decision in Babylon, the place of Babel. He had to make a decision. I'm not bowing my knee. I'm not eating this food. I'm not following this culture. I am going to live separated in a Babylonian context. And understand that the fourth man will even be with you in the fire. Are you hearing me here today? This is the spirit of the Amorite. If you don't control the way you think, you can't take anything. Because you will only transport that worldview into the next season. And God didn't remove the nations because Israel was his favorite. God removed the nations because of their wickedness, not because of their faithfulness. That's what the Bible says. Bible says, and God said, I'm raising you up to become a model of how I created the human race to function, and I have to build a model, and as unfaithful as you are, I'm going to try and work with you. Same with us. So we have to take the will. There's no compromise. Compromise is called lukewarmness, and God will vomit you. There's no compromise. There's no cut and paste. There's no synchronization. There's no synthesis. You just choose how you want to choose, live. And this way is narrow, but it leads you to eternal life. And you know what I'm saying is sounding like I'm a, fan of, a fanatical individual, an extremist. The reality is if you read the Bible, you'd only become that. Narrow is the way to life, but broad is the way to death and destruction. So I ask you to look at this. Let me say this and I'll, I'll start closing. My God, I've got 21 seconds to do two more things. Okay, you're going to give me a few minutes extra. Is that okay, Gordon? A few minutes. Let me say this. The greatest war being fought today is not spiritual war. I know that we, we're, uh, our fight is spiritual. I know that. The greatest war being fought in all sectors of life is an ideological war. If you control the source of communication, like CNN, BBC, Fox, SABS, SBC, and so forth, you control the way people think. That's why there's a blurring between fake news and the truth. Most of us don't know what we believe. Some of us believe that the vaccine was a conspiracy. We never take it. 
Others of us didn't believe that. We took it. Still today, we can't conclude what is right. It's ideological. The greatest battlefield is not the planet. It's your mindset on the planet. And we have been called not to have the mind of this world, but the mind of God, which is the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ. And the ways of God are far above our ways as his thoughts are above our thoughts. So we have to fight this war. And where is it being fought? Ideologically. Because when you leave here, you're going to put the TV on and it's going to cancel what I just said. You're going to watch a movie and it's just going to make you cry and you're going to start believing that love can take place outside of your marriage. You're going to watch something about one of these fake preachers that performs all these false miracles and gave, became super rich and you're going to believe no man of God should be rich. It's going to cancel out. So you're fighting a war. That's why you need to come to the house of God to get the word of God. And it has to, basically what I'm telling you is, you have to develop strong doctrinal positions given to you by apostles so that every thought that has been established in your mind can be uprooted, torn down, thrown out, and then you establish the mind of Christ in the form of apostles' doctrine so that we can go in the way the Lord wants us to go. Now, this kingdom operates with two kings. Two kings. One is a king of a place called Heshbon. Let me give you his name. King Sihon of Heshbon. Okay. Now to defeat this to come against the Amorites, you have to conquer two kings that represent two kingdoms, and they were both Amorites. Okay? Uh, because the spirit of this age that is represented through the Amorite spirit is intellectualism, individualism, postmodernism, anti religion or inter religious beliefs, and obviously. A variety of other things, including materialism. That's this world. Now we have to conquer these, the, the, these kings. And to conquer the, the kings, the first king, Sion means a warrior. Everyone say a warrior. He lived in a capital city called Heshbon. Heshbon means a stronghold. But when you go into the root study of this stronghold, you discover that Heshbon literally means a, a place where things are schemed. A place where you search out to establish plans, inventions, innovations, and strategies as to how you establish domination over your region. So when you talk about the king of Heshbon, um, Sion, you are not just talking about just another king. You're talking about how the spirit strategically, innovatively, inventively, with all the wisdom, earthly wisdom, seeks to grasp out knowledge and then push it out into systems, into schemes, and so forth. And for one, because of time, I'm just going to tell you in a nutshell what the Lord told me. The Lord said to me that the church must possess the ability or upskill itself in the way it thinks, it rationalizes, it, it, it grasps what's happening, it analyzes, it dissects, it develops schemes, and I don't mean carnal schemes, 
It develops inventions. It becomes innovative to create the environment in which you can preserve your dominant worldviews. Now, our dominant worldview is the Word of God. The church needs to understand that nothing can be fixed in this world without the Word. Everything God created was by the Word, and everything that in the aeons of time that have fallen into disrepair or has been compromised, every period of time is characterized by an age. Like we live in an intellectual age. And there was an industrial age. There was different ages. The age of enlightenment and so forth. There were various ages in time. Now, to fix any period of time, you cannot fix it by putting a politician in the, in the parliament. You have to fix it by raising a son of God with a word of God that is a two-edged sword, and when it goes out, it has the anointing of a rapier to pierce, to separate, to establish. But you can't just do it by going and standing on street corners and preaching or carrying your Bible and going into parliament. Because such groups are still under one or two percent in parliament. We have to raise up the sons of God with strategy in mind. Innovation, creating environment. I, I'm even domesticating this to say that if you don't create the right environment when your church gathers, your household, you will never be able to present the word of God. If you have dark lights, I mean dark lights, that sounds right. Dark auditoriums, special lights, you're reaching the emotions of people, the soulish dimension. How do you expect to get to their minds? If you don't create an environment with the right conditions, you know, uh, so that people can concentrate, you create the right culture, the right sound systems, and that's domestic. You're never going to raise the sons of God. Jesus understood about the preparatory steps. I spent a lot of time engaging with my staff on how to create not charismatic environments, but create the right environments where people can sit and embrace God, embrace his word, become the sons of God. Like one of the CEOs of one of the leading institutions in our country sent me a WhatsApp. I read it the other day to some of my sons here. And he said to me, you know, we have to strategize for 2030. And we normally start from 2025 to 2030 in this tertiary and he's the CEO for the whole country. And he's a son in our house. Um, and he said to me, we'll start to 2025 and go to 2030. He said, after I heard your message on strategic thinking, that we must let the end inform our beginning. He said, he said to them, to his team, what do you want in 2030? He said, if we don't have vision, which is revelation, and he quoted the scripture from Matthew, uh, from Proverbs uh, 29 said, if we don't have prophetic vision, then we're going to perish. So they gave him the picture, the ideal for 2030. And he said, okay, now let's go to 2025. And roll out the plan from now to then. He says, what takes them weeks to prepare? In one day they finished it. And the glory of God came into the place. That's what he said to him. Strategic thinking. And I'm hearing this from various people at the moment. That we cannot anymore think in a linear way. We have to think from the heavenly perspective. But you have to be a strategist for this. This king controls strategy. The world has got a 2050 plan. The church doesn't have any plan. So we have to start to be innovative, inventive, take steps of faith get the best equipment, create the right environments, so that when we talk about domination, dominion, possession, people are not going to look at us and say, you can't afford good carpets. You want to tell me you're going to possess the world? You can't even get a decent PA system and you want to teach me how to speak to my people in the lecture halls? You don't understand the way the world thinks and you want to tell me how to conquer that world? So, uh, so I think 
the church has to live in a new prophetic dimension. And prophecy can't always be about personal things. We have to talk about what God wants for the church. Are you with me? There's so much to, to this whole thing, but and obviously you need to pray for wisdom. There's a wisdom that's coming from God now for this. And I'm asking God for this wisdom every day. Wisdom. Wisdom to, to father, to coach, to, to mentor people in different parts of the world that ask me for questions that will determine destinies. They determine the, the, you know, the expenditure of billions. And, and you don't want to just give them head knowledge. And you don't want to talk like you're an expert in their field. But you want to give them the wisdom of God so that they can translate it into, into action. Are you with me? The last thing I want to say to you is the second king that had to be defeated was a king called Og, O-G. It means long neck. It means pride, obstinate, uh, confident. Uh, and, 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 and they say that he had a long neck with a gold chain around it. Now, I've got examples in Durban about this. <laughs> Gold, heavy chains. And in New York, I've seen it there. But it speaks about prosperity. A guy that's so confident and proud because he's prosperous. And actually, he, he was a king. He was a king of a land called Basham, which means fruitfulness. They say his bed, he was so big, he built a bed. And this was a bed that was about 4.7 meters long and over two and a half meters wide. Now, that doesn't mean he was so big. Because you can live in a king-size bed like I do and still be small. <laughs> it just means that he was prosperous. He was inventive. I mean, if his bed was so big, how big was his room? He was fruitful. And this is what God said to me. The church must start becoming fruitful before they cross their Jordan. Some of us are waiting to fly away before we get our mansion. The church has to learn how to tap into an anointing that creates wealth. Abraham became super rich before he saw the land and the city that God was giving him. Before he had a kingdom, kings were entering into coalitions with him because he was such an influential figure in his circle. Now, I'm not into the prosperity message. I've taught against it, the prosperity as it was propagated in a materialistic and consumeristic pattern where you gave to get. I'm against that. But I'm not against prosperity as it's presented in the Bible. I've come to the conclusion that unless you are blessed, you cannot be a blessing. I've seen, because I've been so poor, that I only admired others giving. And I prayed for the day that God will give me the power to give the way I've seen others give. And I don't believe that you're blessed, period. You're blessed to be a blessing. The Bible tells you it's more blessed to give than to receive. So it's not about receiving. It's about how to give what you receive. The word for bashan also means to be a bread giver. Ephrata means fruitful. Bethlehem means the house of bread. In other words, you have to move from being fruitful to becoming a distributor of bread. The only reason I want to get rich is so that I can help all the poor people in my world. Put tools in their hands, give education to kids, not just money. Because poor people will always stay poor if you just give them handouts. But empower them, teach them, instruct them, until everybody has everything in common. And there's no lack, even if you, you're a mountain or a valley, the waters cover everything. Equalization. 
So I'm saying to all of us here today, you have to set your mind on possessing this idea of fruitfulness. And pastors can't believe that they have to stay poor all their lives. I've come to the conclusion that I want to be the first to give at our church. I want to be the, I'm not competing with givers, but I always would like to think that I give the most. I'm not looking for handouts. And I'm not looking for rich people to finance me. And in my circle, I don't hang out with rich people. Simply because I don't want them to take my glory that belongs to God. Are you with me? I've never asked anyone for favors. Why? Because I believe we are living in a time where supernatural wealth is coming to the church. And I'm not talking about this get-rich-quick scheme. I'm talking about how do I become a blessing to others. Abraham became wealthy before he had his Isaac. And he was only thinking about hair and, and how he is going to confer his inheritance, inheritance because he was so rich that he didn't know who was going to take over and he thought it was Eliza, his servant. And God said to him, no, I'm going to give you somebody from your loins. And later on, he learned that to become truly rich, everything you give to your hair, you must lay it on your altar. And you must put your knife to it. And only after he learned how to release his Isaac, God became Jehovah Jireh to him. And, and God then said to him, you sold one son, I make you father of nations. So the church has to learn that fruitfulness never happens by sitting passively. You have to give. And ultimately you have to give your lives. This pedantic, legalistic way of paying your 10% and giving your 2.5% as a first root uh, and, and doing what you are legally supposed to do is over. If you want to see overflow, you have to start learning to overflow in the way you give. And it may be a widow's might. It may be a few rand to start off with. It may be a chicken in the fridge, the last one. It may be investing in a child's school education. And you know that next year your kids have to go to university, but you're offloading for another child. It may be investing in somebody else's business before you think about yours. And obviously being led by the Spirit of God. Nothing, you know, as a philanthropist. We're not philanthropists. We are sons of God. We give. Unless you learn these things, we have to become fruitful. Then we'll cross our Jordan. Then we'll possess our land. Are you with me? There's so much more to say about this. But prosperity is a very big thing in this season. Very big thing. And I'm seeing it already. I'm seeing promotions come. Guys are, guys are becoming heads of conglomerates right now. Yeah. I'm seeing prosperity come upon us, apostolic churches. I, I, I don't know if I said this year. No, I said it in Johannesburg at a church opening. One of the richest pastors in our country that's, that used to be on TBN and FBN once listened to me many years ago, and he said, I've never heard a message like this. We fly in preachers from all over the earth, and you guys are right here. But he said to me, I'll never receive your message. He said, obviously, you guys are advanced in the way you present this. And I said, why? He said, because amongst all your churches, and I've watched you guys, you, you are so poor. You don't have buildings, you're in classrooms, in shopping centers. You're struggling. You can barely pay your rent. He told me this. And he said to me, look at all our churches. He says, I'm a multi-millionaire. We've got super buildings. That's what he said to me. And it was such a slap in my face, but I took it with a pinch of salt. And I said to him these words. I said, you seeing the now, I'm seeing the future.
He said to him, you sing a church that's suffering now. Yes, we may be in the wilderness, but God's forming us for a greater purpose. Formation before function. Position before privilege. I said to him, even Nabal saw David as a little breakaway living in exile with vain ambitions. And others saw David as a refugee in a cave called Adullam with people in debt, distress, discontented, and disillusioned with life. And I said to him, there's coming a day when David is going to take the throne and those men are going to become captains and commanders of his army and there's going to be a mighty move of God in the earth. You seeing a boy being born in a manger, I'm seeing a king sitting on the throne. That's what I said to him. You know what, 30 years later? Those churches are dying. Where they had thousands, they can't even have 200 now. Churches are shutting down because they chose a, an opulent way of living. And our churches are literally flourishing all over. Literally. Literally. New buildings are coming up. Purchases are taking place. Just yesterday, I got a message of, a, of somebody saying, one of your churches doesn't have a building. i am just donated the land and I'm going to pay for the whole building in, in the city of Durban. It's, I mean, it's just, it's just incomprehensible what's happening. Our church in Kenya, uh, not only just they, they bought buildings and they're building, but they decided we're going to help the poor and they built uh, an 18 million rand apartment, I mean, multi-story apartment of flats Five star compared with the best apartments in Cape Town for the, for the churches then. It never happened before. Before you'd go to these places, they were in abject poverty. They couldn't even give you a love gift. I prophesy over you that you need to start learning how to take the spirit of this world. You have to start to become strategic, innovative, and you need to grasp the things that are being told you. You need to adopt the position of Heshbon where you know you're going to wrestle with the word of God until it turns into strategy. And then you must adopt an attitude. I'm going to be fruitful and I'm going to give, give, give because I want to bless, bless, bless. And if anyone wants to get rich to drive the next good car, then that's the wrong reason to get rich. Yes, there's bread for the eater. Enjoy the good car. But remember the seed for the sower. And it's more blessed to give than to receive. I want to be blessed so I can be a blessing. That's period. Please stand with me. You think we can fight this battle? It's ideological. It's in your mind. It's in your heart. It's in your spirit. Let's pull it down. Let's come to the place of believing that we are going to overcome. Lift your hands to the Lord. Lift your hands to the Lord. Come play some music for me, Liam. Come on, just play in the spirit for a little while. Sharabonda Rabasi Kutu. Katatatata. Leketele Mendelebe. Koromondo Robosi Kutu. Karamonda Rabasi Kutu. Sherebendele Mendelebe Sikutu. Korobondo Robosi Kutu. Katatatata. Yeketele Mendelebe Sikutu. Ramonda Rabasikutu, Shakatala Bonda Labasikete, Yeketele Mendele Besikatala Mondalaba, Usi Kotoro Mondo Robosikata, Sheremendele Besikatala, Karamonda Rabasikatala Mon, Karamonda Labashikata. I'm going to pray a special prayer over us. But God is quickening a few things in my spirit. The first thing is, I'm asking God to give us the glory of kings here. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. But it is the glory of God... It's the glory of kings to search out the matter. 
I'm asking God not to give us intellectual minds like the Gnostics, but to give us inquiring minds that knows how to search out the things of God. Like David, he would meditate day and night. He'd go to bed meditating on the Word of God. But not just to quote clever scriptures, but to search out the wisdom of God. God created everything. God created everything. If He's the Creator, then He's made us procreators, not just producing kids, but to produce the systems so that we can fix the world. This world is in trouble. South Africa is in trouble. The answer is not with the politicians. It is with the church of Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. The second thing I want to ask God for here today is not only for us to have strategic thinking, but God is calling us to break this mentality of poverty. And I want to tell you something. I said this to my sons. Cape Town is arguably the most beautiful city in the world. But I have never seen poverty the way I see it when I come into this region. Not the shacks. Not those informal settlements. I see it in the atmosphere. The spirit of austerity which comes from Europe. The spirit of frugality. The f that stingy spirit. That legalistic, I see it whenever I come in. In a beautiful nation. In such a beautiful country. This thing hangs like a cloud. And it clouds the thinking. It's a state of a mentality. I've heard people say to me, yes, I'll serve God. But my father taught me, I must protect my own interest. Or I'll be driven into the ocean. We have to break the spirit once and for all. Are you with me? Ask God for fruitfulness right now. Ask God to free you in your thinking. We are not slaves. Father, release the anointing of a king. A corporate anointing upon this place. Not a king that accumulates horses and chariots. Not a king that, really, that accumulates silver and gold. But a king that knows how to search out matters and rule with a rod that is a scepter of righteousness. That they will rule with revelation. They will strategize. They will think like the way you think. And they will create the way you create. You taught us, oh God, that wisdom builds the house. And wisdom cuts their pillars. Now, Lord, I'm asking that the principal thing called wind's wisdom that Solomon asked for will be given to these kings, the sons of God, the daughters of God that is amongst us. Release the spirit of nobility, of dignity, of strategic thinking, of anticipation. Release it upon this house of God that we will not see ourselves as vagabonds and mere migrants, but we'll see ourselves as citizens of the household of God. I also ask today, Father, that you break the spirit over the atmosphere, especially in the Western Cape. The spirit of poverty that spirit that hovers over people, that spirit of austerity, that spirit of stinginess, that spirit of fear of not having, the spirit that robs us from giving, the joy of giving, the hilarious spirit of giving, the spontaneity of giving, the generosity that is the spirit of mercy. Lord, let that spirit come upon our households. That our people will no more be shackled, but free to do the things that we learn from ancestors like our father Abraham. So I bless this house today. I thank you, Lord, that you will teach your people the way and the thoughts of the principal power that rules over this, this time. And that Western spirit, that ideological spirit will be brought down. And Christ and every thought of Christ will be exalted in the season. I bless your people. And I pray, Lord, that you will touch the minds of your servants and their tongues. Like you did on the day of Pentecost when cl cloven tongues of fire fell on their tongues. That they would speak the utterances of God to the nations of the world. So release a new language amongst us. A new speech. A new way of thinking.
I bless this house. I bless every ministry represented here. Every business, every people group here. I bless them in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you.